Hi, and welcome back to The Daily's Double Shot. I'm Trinisa Jackson, the assistant producer of the show. Here at The Daily, we pride ourselves in getting student life from a student perspective. And in this episode, we continue to do so by grabbing stories from all around campus to give you a snapshot of the story that is UW. Let's jump right into things. Yeah, yeah. I'll see you there. Okay. Hey, my name is Dylan Byron. For my first project for the Daily Double Shot, I traveled pretty far north on the Ave to investigate the opening of a mysterious new shop called the Hippie Raver. Uh, I met the owner, he's a very interesting guy, and I hope you enjoy what I found. In late summer 2014, a new storefront emerged on the far north end of the Ave. A business called the Hippie Raver lends itself to be more than just a store by providing culture, company, and an invitation to a world of art and experience. I got the chance to speak with owner Ken Tompkins about his endeavor. I've been running multilingual books since 95, and we originally started a Little Rave bookstore inside uh, in the late 90s. And our first business was doing so good, we shut it down at that time. And then recently I was going to a startup meeting, and somebody was like, go with your passion. And I was like, we had a really popular Facebook page, or we still do. And I decided it would be more real to have a store and get to meet people. And, um, there are some products that I felt are hard to find, like onesies and glow poi and stuff like that. So I thought it'd be nice for people to have a shop to be able to get those things. People come in here, a lot of people in the summer, they were just laughing, taking pictures in front of the sign and stuff. Uh, they're like, oh, take a picture in front of the Hippie Raver sign. But then they come in and, you know, as I said, it's like a chance to define what a Hippie Raver is to some extent, even though it's, it's sort of, yeah, it's random. So. One day somebody brings us some art, one day somebody brings us some clothes, and you know, we put different things in the window and um, have a lot of really interesting conversations. I got to meet like a lot of people that were going to Freak Night and uh, realized that it was just everybody. It wasn't like one type of person. Ken spoke very highly of local talent, including that of UW students. He strongly encourages anyone making music, art, clothing, or anything else to come in and share with Hippie Raver. I had like a DJ come in when we first opened, and we ended up uh, making a web page for him. He could take a picture of him right here, and then took his SoundCloud and made a web page and became Facebook friends. So it's, yeah, it's definitely extending it where it's not like, okay, am I going to be at my desk job all day and then go to a party once a week, get to extend it and um, you know, be exposed to a lot more art and music and cool people. First couple of months were a little slow, but we didn't really have that many products. So we just sort of organically have uh, got more products as people you know, suggest them or bring them in or you know, we find them. And so uh, yeah, no, I'm really happy. I think part of the reason we started Hippie Raver is that hippies have been maligned and ravers have been maligned. Um, just off topic for a second, I feel that hippies back in the 60s stated that we should take care of the environment. They had a lot of suggestions that could have slowed down global warming. Um, a lot of hippies are vegetarians, which use only one fifth of the resources. Um, and a lot of hippies and ravers don't really drink. So overall, the drug use is actually slightly lower than society at all. Um, you know, I think for some people, when they do do like a psychedelic, they've had an experience that helps make them more creative that they might have had anyway. So I don't think it's really essential because um, a lot of people, when they go to a party, are completely sober and they're often the funnest people. Hi. This week we started a new segment called Study Break, where we find ways to rejuvenate your swollen brain after you've been slamming it against a textbook for several hours. This week, I managed to escape my responsibilities for about an hour or so at Guanaco's Tacos Pupusaria. 
an El Salvadorian joint on Brooklyn and 41st. Why come here, you may ask? Its simple style and location off of the app make it perfect for a quick escape from UW and its purple and golden clad hordes. In the cold, dark night of Seattle, a corn tortilla pupusa filled with cheese, pork, and cactus really helps stave off the winter blues. The yuca and pastelito on the side providing that extra study energy. So, if you're in the mood for a break in a truly authentic El Salvadorian style, try guanacos. That is, if you think you'll be able to get anything done after stuffing yourself. Hey everyone, we're here at the Hub with the Fencing Club, as you can see. I'm going to put myself to the challenge to see if fencing is hard or not. Shouldn't be too hard. So let's go check it out. Fencing is the art and science of defense. If you're actually against somebody who wants to hurt you, you want to, you'd rather not get hurt than hurt them. I mean, the, uh, the whole idea is you don't want to die. You want to, yeah, I don't know, self-preservation and all that. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's far more important to stay safe than to hit the other guy. Speaking about safety, let's make sure I have the right attire and equipment to be safe and protected. Here we have Kirsten Ma helping me get set up with the half jacket and then putting on a glove to keep my hand protected and make sure it fits. Finally, we put on the mask to protect the head and the neck. It's called a plum, which is your first position. And relax. And make sure your thumb is still at one o'clock. First, I broke my point and all that kind of stuff. And then you're going to lunge by pushing off of your back leg with your back heel. Mm -hmm. like that. You want to make sure that your front leg is pointed straight with your toe. Your knee is over your foot. And your back leg is straight. You can't stop it, but you're going to be And recover by coming back Stay and make sure to bring your arm back to the and table. You were so relaxed that when you took the and you can actually wipe your hands just a little bit. There you go. We practice fencing, like what you may see about fencing is you may see it more of a sport. We are, we're one of the last schools left in the world who actually practice it as a martial art. We don't do, we don't go to competitions for win shiny trophies. We do, we practice fencing like you would practice any other martial art to stay healthy and to stay safe. <laughs> Now that we've seen the pros, let me show you how it's done now that I've been trained. Step out. You're wearing a mask. Yes. You're wearing a mask. 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 You're w
I believe what is one of the interesting things about the fencing club here, not only is the fencing important, but it's also about etiquette and manners. So you really start tying into a lot of the history and ways of behavior that people tend to forget about. And so that's very interesting. You learn more than fencing. You really start to get a, a, a much larger picture of history and, and bits of etiquette that we take for granted these days. Hands on the blades, and then you step forward and shake. Same thing. Okay. How does that feel? I'm sore. It's fine. You don't feel that muscle. Okay. Okay. Oh, that is harder than I thought. I thought it was just. Hey guys, fencing is not as easy as it looks. There's a lot of muscle tension, a lot of relaxing, just overall really hard, but it's really fun though once you get it down because they taught me step by step on how to do everything and you should definitely join Thursdays 6 to 8. See you there. Hi, I'm Teresa Jackson, the assistant producer for The Daily's Double Shot. And I'm Dylan McDonald, film reviewer for The Daily. And we're here today to talk about the film Dear White People. You're listening to Winchester University's only college radio station. Dear white people, the minimum requirement of black friends needed to not seem racist has just been raised to two. Sorry, but your weed man, Tyrone, does not count. Dear white people, please stop touching my hair. Does this look like a petting zoo to you? Mistress in, dating a black person to piss off your parents is a form of racism. The show is racist. Black people can't be racist. Racism describes a system of disadvantage based on race. So Dylan, mm -hmm. overall, what did you think about the movie? Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I thought that it's it's a well put together film. You know, all the shots are very lovely. Um, the acting is great. I think I don't know what the budget on it was, but I, I think it was a fairly low budget film, and yet it's still a lot better than a lot of the other films that are much larger budget these days. Yeah, I will say I did like that. How the main character was mixed. She was both white and black. Right. So that sort of, um, she was in the middle of everything, mm -hmm. but at the same time, she was the activist of the whole film. Right. Um, I feel that, yes, we do feel like we're in sort of a post-racial society, and this film does raise up some of these issues. And I like how they did it in more of a satirical, comical kind of way, mm -hmm. and less so as like a serious, you know, hard-hitting documentary type deal. Right, yeah, I think it's easier, to, it's easier to discuss them in a comedy. We can kind of laugh at it, and we can kind of, we can, you can do more, I think, in a comedy than in a drama. It's right. easy to, to push the topic, so to speak, because it's more lighter, and right. it's not like you're walking on eggshells, so to speak. Right, people expect that you're going to push the boundary somewhere. Exactly, right. exactly. But I don't see what the point is in blaming white folks for everything. I really don't see the issue. Never ran into any lynch mob. It would be good to elect someone like you as school president. Someone else is running. Together, we can bring black back to Winchester. Yes! Who does Sam think she is? It's like Spike Lee and Oprah had some sort of pissed off baby. Um, so what did you think about the main character being mixed? Um, played by Tessa Thompson, who was also in uh, Four Color Girls. Um, and, you know, a few other films. Right. I think my main thoughts on, on her being mixed race was that, uh, you know, she, she, in the film, I think she, she, she's torn between this sort of white and black identity, and she, she overcompensates by being this sort of radical black nationalist identity. She, she goes full black. She goes more, more towards blackness than whiteness. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how any, like any other individual deals with being mixed race. I think everyone kind of, has, kind of comes to their own solution. Um, but I think it's that this the, the film presents like a not a right answer, but just an answer. Like this is one way to be. It's not maybe the right way. You know, obviously she has problems with it internally as a character. Um, but she ultimately 
achieves a resolution at the end, and I think that that's kind of the point of the film, is that, you know, there is no right or wrong answer, but just keep trying to find an answer. I think you'll end up with something. So what do you think about sort of their selections as far as the characters that were sort of in the film mm -hmm. and how they were chosen to be portrayed? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a pretty good... I mean, you know, you can never catch, like, the whole of society because you've only got... You're only working with four main characters. Um, so you have to kind of pick and choose. But I think it's a pretty good cross-section. You've got, you know, like you said, the investigative journalist who he's, he's black, he's gay, and he's also really nerdy. And uh, the, the issues that he deals with is this kind of, like, he, he doesn't want to pick an allegiance to one side or another. He's like, this is who I am as a full person. Um, I'm not going to... You know, I'm not just going to be black. I'm not just going to be gay. I'm not just going to watch Star Trek. Do you think that sort of came out of left field and was just sort of thrown in there, the whole him being not just black mm -hmm. and the only black journalist on campus, so to speak, right. investigative, but being gay as well, throwing in that um, topic as well? I mean, I don't I don't know if I can quite like judge that. My, my feeling on it was that it made it. It made him more real as a character. It's like you know, you don't have to be stereotypically black, like like or, or stereotypically gay, like effeminate gay. He's just he is gay. He is black. These are all parts of who he is. He is as a full character, though. You know, he wants to be a journalist. Like that's his dream. Um, and yet, these are all just parts of that identity. Yeah. So I didn't think it like. I mean, that's how a real black person or a real gay person or a real nerd is. You know, they just they're a full person. You can't label them with just one thing. I listen to Mumford and Sons and watch Robert Altman movies. I think I'm black enough for the union. I know, please. You're only technically black. All right, so what do you feel about the race war that went on at the college? Right. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, it's based on a lot of... We've seen these other, like, Ivy League colleges where they have, like, a blackface party or, or things like that. Um, so, obviously, uh, there's a real-world precedent for it. This, this is happening right now. We have... These, these fraternities and things that throw these kinds of parties. Um, so clearly we're not, we're not as post-racial as we think. You know, clearly there is some unresolved racial thing going on. I don't know, uh, I don't know what, how to resolve it. Obviously it's a huge issue, but the fact this film brings it up and says like, look, we're not done with racism yet. We haven't solved it yet. Um, do you think that when they had the um, newspaper clippings at the end, you know, for the credits, that right. sort of made it real? Yeah, it's it reminds me of um, like uh, in Spike Lee's Spike Lee did Malcolm X, and he did that in like '92. You know, Malcolm X is this you know figure from the '50s and '60s, but it was '92 when the film came out, so he included these shots of the Rodney King riots because they were just just finished that going on. So it's this sort of like. You think this is a past event, but this is, you know, we're still dealing with it right now. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Like, this is, yeah, it's a fictional film, but it's based on something that just happened. Yeah. You know? And honestly, I guess I would say that was one of my favorite parts mm -hmm. of the film, surprisingly, because it showed that this movie isn't so far left field. Right. That has no relevance to us at all right. as college students or, you know, as people in general. Um, but for especially those of us that are in college, it definitely sort of brings that home. So I think that that actually added a lot to the film. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't expecting that. It was a great twist. Yeah. Do you feel that the movie grazed across this topic mm -hmm. of you know, racial issues, or do you think it actually sort of dug a little bit into it? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a... Sh it's, I think it's only... I don't think it's two hours, you know. It's just kind of a shorter... Yeah, it's one hour and 46 minutes, I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you can't do everything in that time. Um, I think the film was sort of, like, raising issues along the way. It's like, this is an issue, this is an issue. Um, but also sort of going, like, well, we don't have time in this hour and 46 minutes to solve it. But as an audience member, you know, you go home tonight, you have these kinds of conversations with the people you know. And, I mean, I personally, I you know, I took the bus there and back to see the film. Um, and so on the bus ride back, a lot of these people who were in the theater with me were riding the bus home. and we, So we were having these conversations uh, you know, different people from different backgrounds um, having these conversations on the way home. And I think that's the point of the film is like, yeah, you can't solve it in the space of a movie, but if you go home and you have these conversations in your day-to-day -day life, you know, it's just basically like understanding that, that these conversations aren't done. They didn't end in the 60s, you know. They, they, still, they still need to be had now. I think for black youth and what this film presents is, is a, you know, a more positive image going forward. And I think you know, that's just, even just to present it, even to say that like we don't know the answers, but to present it at least is to to move things forward.
So how did you feel about the ending of the film? You've got no idea what they see when they see you. You've got a thing for Taylor Swift. I know, because my Mac picks up your Mac's library. I was so careful. You don't understand. Girls like me have to pick a side. I'm sick of your tragic mulatto bull. I can't say mulatto. Mulatto, mulatto, mulatto. Sort of the build up to the conflict, and then once reaching the conflict, there being some, you know, disturbances amongst the higher elites, and then obviously um, the resolution at the end that involves the main character, Sam. Right. Um,. You know, she that's kind of her her character, she she finds this sort of anarchist thing. Like she's gonna she's gonna stir it up, she's gonna make change one way or another, even though it may not be peaceful change, it may not be uh, uh, easy change either. But she's gonna make something happen basically, like something needs to happen in her mind. Um, whereas Lionel, the, the, the reporter kid, he you know, he he finds himself, you know, he cuts his hair, that kind of thing. He but he finds a place for himself in the investigative journalism, and also he's got some new friends that he's made. So, so his his resolution is more is more peaceful. You know, he's like just he feels accepted now. Um, and then you see the uh, Troy, the jock kid, he, him and Coco, um, that they don't date because like it's part, it's not it doesn't work with his image. So they're they they don't get like a happy ending because they didn't. I don't think that they worked through their stuff the way that the other characters did. And I think that's sort of. You know, the point of the film, yeah, is that if you don't work through this stuff, it's not going to get better. Like, you, you can find a solution. The radical girl, Sam, she finds a radical solution, but at least she's trying something. Whereas Troy and Coco, they just kind of stay where they are, and they don't become better people. I think that's the message. If there is a message, it's like, you just, you can't, you got to find something. You got to try something. You can't just stay in one spot the whole time. All right, so do you have any final comments or suggestions about the film that you would like to tell, you know? Um, I mean, if you if it's playing in your area, go see it, you know, um, keep an eye out for the, you know, DVD or, or if you see it on demand or something, however you can see it, go see it. That's, uh, it's just, a, you know, it's a film that needs to be seen moving forward in American life, I think. Thanks for watching, and you heard what Dylan said, go ahead and check out the film. Each year as Thanksgiving approaches, Washington State gets split in two, a line drawn in the sand over a century ago, a rivalry that pits friend against friend, neighbor against neighbor, cats against dogs, the Apple Cup. Still has the football after the play fake, going into the end zone, wants Davis or Bobo. Touchdown, Washington State! Named after the state's famous apple harvest, the very first Apple Cup was played in Seattle in the year 1900 and resulted in a bizarre 5-5 to -5 tie. Since then, there have been 106 editions of the game played both here in Seattle as well as in Pullman. The Huskies have proved statistically stronger of the two sides, winning 68 games, while the Cougars have only won 32. There have been six ties in the 114 years of the Apple Cup, but since the rule change in 1995, the NCAA will no longer allow stalemates in college football. History books may favor UW, but this is certainly a game where the teams leave their record in the locker room and step out onto the field with a passion that cannot be dampened by numbers. Anything can happen. So first and 10 at the 25, Cowan back, throws, Price is gonna be right there and pick it off. And as you say, that's the football game. Enter 1982, the era of Don James. His team had beaten the Cougars the last seven years. His team had just beaten number 10 UCLA and number three ASU. His team was in the top five in the nation and his team lost. That year, the Cougs had only won two games the entire season and the game got billed as a blowout in the making. However, for the first time in 32 years, the game was to be played on WSU's campus as opposed to Joe Alvey Stadium in Spokane. Head coach of the Cougars, Jim Walden, had been quoted earlier in the season saying, nothing in my job, not the Rose Bowls, not the Holiday Bowls, nothing is more important than beating the University of Washington. And that held very true for the Cougars on that day 32 years ago. The Huskies have been Rose Bowl hopefuls and the Cougars had been bottom of the barrel in the Pac-10. But after a four point loss, the Huskies chances at Rose Bowl glory were dashed and the Cougars were ecstatic. An entire season washed from a memory by a win at the Apple Cup. 
A summation of this sentiment can be seen in numerous bars around Pullman today where pieces of the 1982 goalpost can still be found after it was torn down by WSU fans charging the field after the game. The Apple Cup had to be postponed a week following the assassination of JFK. When the two teams did meet, the Huskies came out on top 14-0, propelling them into the Rose Bowl. And Sider gets the Huskies across for the first touchdown with a lateral to Dave Cope. Tolliver again with a razzle-dazzle lateral to Jim Warren that has 96,000 fans fooled. He's over, and Illinois goes ahead. <laughs> Last year, on a foggy Black Friday, the first Apple Cup was played at the new Husky Stadium. Keith Price, with a little help from Bishop Sankey and Austin Safarian Jenkins, led the Huskies to a 27-17 victory. And on Saturday, November 29th, the Dogs will head east to Pullman for the 107th installation of the Apple Cup. The Huskies are looking good for a bull berth, while the Cougs are floundering down at the bottom of the table. But as we know from the last 114 years, this one game can write an entire season, as well as define the crap talk for the year. And whether you bark or meow, the Apple Cup represents state pride and getting past differences to celebrate each other's differences. But go dogs. Dailydub.com slash double shot and our YouTube channel, The Daily Dub. Okay. Well, that's all the content we have for you this episode, and we hope you enjoyed watching. Tune in in two weeks for our next episode, but until then, you can check us out at dailydub.com slash double shot and on our YouTube channel, The Daily Dub. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on The Daily Double Shot.